What a pleasure it is to be back here. Favorite uh, place. So thank you. And thank you for being here, giving up part of a view today to talk about some perhaps unpleasant topics. It's very brave of you. I promise by the end there may be some hope. So you're seeing the same phenomenon that I am. There's so many problems in so many countries. In the headlines all the time, oppression, corruption, war, hunger, poverty, refugees. What are the factors that are driving these serious global pathologies? Is there anything we could possibly do to lessen these kinds of problems? Well, tonight we're going to be talking about oil. And you're a sophisticated group of people, so I'm just going to imagine that if we started talking about oil, we would agree pretty quickly about a few things. First, because of climate change, we must be getting off oil and in fact all fossil fuels just as fast as we possibly can. Second, Western governments, and especially the government of this country, have for many decades committed questionable, unjust acts for the sake of oil all around the world, and especially in the Middle East. Third, Western oil companies, and again, particularly companies from this country, have for decades engaged in questionable, exploitative actions for the sake of oil all around the world. I just would imagine that if we started talking, we would agree on those basic facts. So I'm going to take that mostly for granted and come back to each of them toward the end. But I want to start with a story that hasn't been told. This is a deeper story about how we as consumers are forced every day to fund much of the suffering and injustice in the world that ends up in our headlines including our headlines about what happens right here. Our own laws are forcing us to empower some of the world's most dangerous men whenever we fill up with gas. Now, as I said, we need to stop using oil just as fast as we possibly can. But that's going to take a little while. Today, oil is humanity's single largest source of energy. The world uses a thousand barrels of oil every second. It's about three Olympic-sized swimming pools worth of oil each and every second. Over 90% of the world's transportation runs on oil. It's almost every car, ship, plane, and boat that there is. fossil fuels together, oil, gas, and coal. Together, the fossil fuels provide 85% of humanity's energy, while all of the renewables together account for around 4%. So renewables are taking off a very low baseline. The fossil fuels, we need to get off as fast as we possibly can. But it is going to take a while, and oil in particular is going to take us a while to get past. Oil is not just used for transportation. We consumers spend money on oil when we buy any number of everyday goods. I just put a few of them on the slide. So, if it's plastic, if it's plastic, it's oil. Think about going to the grocery store. All the plastic wrapping you see, it's all oil. Oil, you might have brushed your teeth with it this morning. It might be in the waistband of your briefs. You might have 
smeared on your face this morning, it might be hell in your sex life. Oil is absolutely everywhere. And we pay for oil almost every time we go to the cash register or buy something on the line. And where does the money that we pay for gasoline and all these products, where does it go? Here's a map of the countries whose main export is oil. So in the black you see the world's big artery of oil stretching down from Siberia through the Middle East into North and Central Africa. And here's a map of the oil producing states that are either authoritarian or failed states. That's the resource curse, sometimes called the paradox of plenty. There's something about having a lot of oil that's very dangerous for the politics and the economics of many countries. Here's one way to see the resource curse. Think about all of the amazing economic progress, political progress, sometimes that the developing world has seen over the last 40 years. India, Chile, China. In contrast to that, the world's leading oil states outside the West are on average today no richer, no freer, and no more peaceful than they were, even in 1980. All those hundreds of billions of dollars going into these countries for oil no richer, no freer, no more peaceful. And in fact, we see the resource curse all the time in the headlines. Here are six facts. Most authoritarians are in oil-rich countries. So are the most highly corrupt regimes. Most civil wars are in oil-rich countries. Most of the world's refugees flee from these countries. The countries with the most hunger are rich with oil, and soon most extreme poverty will be in oil-rich countries. The resource curse is helping to drive some of the world's most dramatic problems. So more specifically, where does our money go when we buy gasoline or plastic anything made from or transported with oil. Well, some of it goes to Saudi Arabia. Mohammed bin Salman, Mohammed bin Salman, who seems to have ordered the killing of that Washington Post journalist. I ran the numbers. Last year, the average American household sent about $60 to Saudi Arabia buying gasoline. Not enough to buy bone saw. On a larger scale, Mohammed bin Salman is also prosecuting the war in Yemen, probably the world's biggest humanitarian disaster, which has included the largest cholera outbreak in recorded history. Some of our money goes to Equatorial Guinea, a small country in Central Africa, the world's longest reigning ruler, a dictator called Obiang, has for decades had his opponents tortured in this notorious Black Beach prison. Much of the country has fled because of the fierce repression of Obiang's regime. And some of our money goes to Angola, where the elite lives in luxury, while the children of the country have been dying literally at the highest rate in the world. Are you seeing what I'm saying?
This is the law of every state that says it will be legal to buy oil and other natural resources from whoever in other countries can control them by force. This is the law that lawyers call effectiveness, which literally means might makes right. So, for example, years ago, when Saddam Hussein's regime took over Iraq in a coup, it became legal under American law to buy Iraq's oil from Saddam. And then years later, when ISIS took over some of those same wells, by default, it became legal to buy Iraq's oil from ISIS. That's why we had to impose sanctions to make it illegal. Every country's default law for the natural resources of other countries is Whoever can control it by force can sell it to us. Now, that's such an ancient rule that we take it for granted. That's just how global trade works. But if you think about it, that law doesn't even make common sense. I mean, if an armed gang takes over that BP station right near the Lincoln Tunnel, if an armed gang takes over the BP station, should American law give the gang the right to sell off the gas and keep the money? But when Gaddafi took over Libya in a coup, American law did give Gaddafi the right to sell out Libya's oil. And then years later, during the Arab Spring, when rebels took over those same wells, American law gave the rebels the right to sell us the oil. Oil is the world's single biggest commodity. And that's why oil such trouble. There's so much money in oil. But our law says might makes right, not only for oil, but for almost all natural resources in other countries. So, for example, in my phone, in your phone, there might be a small piece of the Congo that was extracted at gunpoint by one of those terrible militias in the, con in the Congo who have used sexual violence as a weapon of war so extensively that the Congo has been called the worst place in the world to be a woman. But even if there are conflict minerals in your phone and my phone, I guarantee you we own our phones, every molecule, under American law. And some of the money that we paid for our phones might have gone back to the Congo to help those militants buy more bullets bayonets. This law, might makes right, puts us into legal business relationships with violent and coercive men abroad, and for years they've been causing a lot of trouble with <coughs> our money. Effectiveness, might makes right, incites violence and oppression. To see why, just do a quick thought experiment. Imagine for a moment that the state of New York declared might makes right for all the goods of New Jersey. So imagine tomorrow the New York legislature passes a law that says any goods that can be seized by force in New Jersey will be legally purchasable in New York. What do you think New Jersey would look like after a while? See what? Crime kings, syndicates, turf wars, just the kinds of things we actually do see on a much bigger scale in resource rich countries around the world because our law does say might makes right. Here's the crucial political science point about the resource curse. Effectiveness turns oil into the world's largest source of unaccountable power, absolute power. Because every country says, might mix right. Whoever can control oil by force in other countries, it's like a huge funnel of money just goes straight into their hands. Now, 
for them, that money is much better than foreign aid. Because foreign aid always comes with strings attached. The money they get from oil is much better than bank loans. Because bank loans you have to pay back. With oil, you never have to pay the money back. And the money from oil comes in entirely unaccountable to the people of the country who have to watch from behind fences as the natural resources of their country are sold off beyond their control. Authoritarians and armed groups who can control oil, they don't need an educated, healthy, productive population. They don't even need the country to be at peace. They get all the money they need for their power from controlling a few holes in the ground. As long as they can control those oil wells, they can divide and rule their country, they can buy off threats, repress their people, or sometimes just ignore their population almost entirely. So you can see why so many people in oil-rich countries think of oil as a curse. This is also important. When we're looking for the resource curse in the news, we shouldn't just be looking for disasters that happen over there. The unaccountable power of oil is bad for many people over there, but it also comes back to affect us here. The power of oil ends up cursing us West also. Now to show that, I'm just going to rewind, going backwards through 40 years of some of the West's most significant threats, threats and crises. As I go back through these 40 years, I'm just going to ask and see if you can see one thing that these threats and crises have in common. So, now we see Vladimir Putin interfering in Western elections, invading Western uh, European country, bombing um, in Syria, on that. Also in Syria, Assad, overwhelming his own people, intensifying a refugee crisis that put pressure on the politics of Europe. In Syria and Iraq, there was ISIS with their atrocities, beheadings, sexual slavery. Before ISIS, it was Gaddafi, sponsored terrorism for 40 years, from the Munich Olympic massacres to the IRA. Before Gaddafi, Al-Qaeda, behind 7-7 in London, and bus below about 100 meters from my flat. Of course, Al-Qaeda also behind 9-11. Saddam Hussein destabilized the Middle East from 1990 on when he invaded Kuwait. And for 40 years, the Iranian regime has been sponsoring militant groups around the Middle East from Hezbollah to Islamic Jihad. So did you see the common factor? All of those threats and crises came from countries that are rich with oil. Since it's us that's been buying that oil, it's been our money that's been behind the men who are responsible for those threats and crises. We have made these men unaccountably powerful. And once one sees the oil curves, as a problem of unaccountable power in oil rich states, one gets a new perspective on the West's strategies to try to contain the power of oil from outside. So the West needs to do something about these authoritarian leaders enriched by oil money. For the past 40 years, the West has tried three main strategies to try to control the power of oil from outside of these countries. 
Sometimes the West has tried to make alliances with a oil-rich authoritarian, the Shah of Iran, Saddam, Gaddafi, the Saudis. Question, how is the strategy working? Sometimes the West has taken military action to try to control the power of oil, Gulf War I, Gulf War II, Libya, cover the region in drones. How's it working? Sometimes the West tries to impose sanctions, Iran, Iraq, Sudan, Syria, Russia. How's it working? Beyond all of the expense, deaths, and reputational damage, simply in terms of geopolitical stability, how have the West's attempts to control the power of oil from outside been going? Well, not too long ago, a director of the CIA testified before Congress that the Middle East is the worst it's been for 50 years and that the region faces unprecedented bloodshed. It seems that the West can't control the power of oil from outside these countries. It seems that nobody can. So the resource curse is a very serious problem, both for them there and for us here. And I'm sorry to say that it looks like the problem may well just get worse. Because of climate change, the oil-producing states, especially around the equator, will be getting hotter and hungrier and thirstier at the same time as they experience a youth bulge and the region fills up with more powerful explosives and drones. So if we stay with this law of might makes right, the future may well look like the past, only more so. More popular uprisings, maybe men with greater authoritarian oppression, leading to the spread of more violent Is there any hope for change? Honestly, I don't know. It could be we're stuck with this law. It could be for the rest of our lives when we go shopping, we're just going to be sending our own money to empower authoritarians, corrupt officials, violent militias, and so on. It could be that this problem is too hard.
this principle that a country belongs to its people. If anyone decides to sell off a country's resources without minimal accountability to the citizens, then they are literally stealing the country's resources. Now, I said the hope is that there's already a wide consensus around the world on that principle. World leaders just stand up and say, the oil belongs to the people. So here I collected some world leaders who stood up and said, the oil belongs to the people. We got Tony Blair, Bush, and Clinton. That's Ayatollah Khamenei, Brazil, Mexico, Australia, the Norwegian Parliament, Ghana. Politicians already say, the oil belongs to the people. That's a very popular thing for politicians to say, because when we do polls, in every region of the world, there are large majorities that say, we believe that every country belongs to its people, and that includes the Middle East. And another hopeful sign is that the treaties are already in place. Both of the main human rights treaties say in Article 1, all peoples may, for their own ends, freely dispose of their natural wealth and resources. In fact, that idea that the people should control the resources of the country is stated twice in both treaties. It's stated more than is any other human right in both of the main treaties. So the words are already on the page. 98% of the human beings in the world live in a country that's already ratified one of those treaties. And insofar as the world has heroes, they are men like Gandhi and Mandela who fought and won the battle for the principle that every country belongs to its people. So you might think that everything is in place to replace that battle of will of effectiveness with the principle that a country belongs to its people. Even so, it would be natural to be a bit skeptical that such a big change could be made. After all, if we really believe that a country belongs to its people, that over half the world's traded oil right now is literally stolen from its country of origin. It might be natural to be skeptical that the system keeping that oil trade in place could be changed. In my more hopeful moments, I can tell you what gives me hope that it might be possible to get rid of this battle. What sometimes gives me hope is the big historical picture. In the span of history, effectiveness has been abolished, abolished many times before in other areas. 300 years ago, effectiveness, Mike makes right, was the world's rule not only for natural resources, but for almost everything. So 300 years ago, might makes right was the law that made the slave trade legal. Every country's rule was whoever can seize Africans by force can legally sell them to us. And under that rule, 12 million Africans were forced through the middle of the passage where the survivors were legally bought as property here. 300 years ago, might made right for people. Even 100 years ago, effectiveness made colonial rule legal. The international rule was any country that could coercively dominate another people got the internationally recognized legal right to rule those people as the sovereign. Again, might made right. Even in our own times, effectiveness made apartheid legal. The international rule was whoever could keep the course of control over a population can maintain a racist white regime. Ethnic cleansing, even genocide, used to be permitted by international law. <coughs> what 
which was little more than the legitimation of violence. But the good news is, all of those dimensions of effectiveness that I just mentioned have now been made illegal in international law. The slave trade, colonial rule, apartheid, ethnic cleansing, genocide, these are all now violations of international <coughs> law. And in fact, we've even abolished effectiveness for a single natural resource, which is diamonds. Almost every important country now makes it illegal to import diamonds that have been harvested by armed groups. Now, of course, in breaking all these legal links between might and right, we haven't magically abolished power. Right? I mean, slaves are still secretly trafficked across borders. Blood diamonds still seep into global commerce. But the great progress that humanity has made over the past 300 years has largely been turning what used to be accepted practices of violence into widely revived crime. Could we do it for the other natural resources? That's the question. We've set up an NGO called Clean Trade. You can go to cleantrade.org, which is a registered charity in the UK, and there'll be a US branch before long. Clean Trade's mission is to try to end the resource curse by promoting the human right of all peoples to control the natural resources of their countries. We work with investors, we work with firms, we work with especially governments of importing countries like this one to show how there could be a peaceful, gradual transition away from my mix right to a better system. The secret is for importing countries like this one to align their laws with their own principles. If we believe that every country belongs to its people, then we should make it illegal to import any resources that have been sold off without minimal accountability to the citizens. With clean trade, we would just change who we buy oil from. We would say to the government of Saudi Arabia, who rules in your country is none of our business. But because we believe the oil belongs to your people, until you're minimally accountable, you'll get none of our business. It's about changing what we do here. This reform that I just mentioned, <coughs> ban on imports of authoritarian oil, is economically feasible. America has a lot of oil right now. I just did the numbers this morning. America gets about 3% of its oil from authoritarian countries. We can switch away from that without much pain in the pump at all. And here's a better idea. As long as we're getting rid of authoritarian oil imports, why don't we take that as an opportunity to switch over to the renewable fuels of the future? Our countries could take a peaceful, principled stand for the rights of all peoples, which would encourage democratic reformers in other countries to make the reforms that they, not we, need to make in the governments of those countries. We've already had a success in clean trade. The world's fifth largest country, Brazil, has introduced clean trade legislation into the Senate. This bill would make it illegal for Brazil to import any oil from authoritarian countries, and it would also prohibit the national oil company Petrobras from signing any new contracts with authoritarian regimes. Brazil, if Brazil can do it, why couldn't we do it here? So if you go to the Clean Trade website, you'll see all sorts of things that can be done to spur the campaign forward. We did the numbers and we found which oil companies do more of their business with authoritarian regimes. There's an index there where you're going to fill up with gas. You can uh, 
go to the station which does less business with authoritarian regimes. There's lots of uh, things that we can do as consumers. I have to say our newest campaign is ending blood plastic. We're trying to encourage people not to use single-use plastics anymore. This is blood plastic as much as anything else. That's more of our money going to the, the uh, dangerous men. So, we're trying with clean trip. We're trying our best. Before we open the discussion, I'm really so interested to hear what you think about these ideas. Let me just add this final thought. I mean, I know that it would be natural to say that the resource curse is just the way the world works, it's the way the world's always worked, and nothing can be done about it. But if you think about it, that's just how the slave trade and blood diamonds seemed to serious people before each of them were made illegal. Humanity has now abolished its old law of violence for all of the practices I mentioned in history. We know the better rule that we should transition to now. The question is, can we get ourselves out of business with the men of blood when we go shopping and fill up our tanks? Could we, if we acted together, create a world beyond blood oil? Because 
that's on the map were countries whose main export was oil. And oil is not in, anywhere near the U.S.'s main export. Nevertheless, do, do the people own the they resources do. in the U.S.? They do. And, and in fact, you notice that it was George W. Bush who was one of the people who said, who just stood up and said, the people own the oil. And Bush is an oil man from Texas, right? So even George Bush believes that the people own So here's how it works. The people own the country, which means that the resources start out in the people's hands. Now, as long as there's minimal accountability of the government, anything can happen to the resources. As it happens in this country, we privatize them. So if oil is discovered off of Louisiana, the government holds an auction, the oil companies bid for the oil, and then whoever gets it pays the money into the public treasury. Yes. So the people start out owning the oil, right? And we get the government for the saying people in the United States own this oil. And then we privatize it. That's okay, because we do have a minimally accountable government. Now that might be another place to say, do we really have a minimally accountable government? And all I mean by that is we have sufficient civil liberties and political rights that you can protest what the government is doing without fearing for your life or freedom. And, put it this way, if 100 million Americans voted to ban fracking or whatever, I do believe in fracking, and I think you can see that even here in New York State, uh, there's sufficient public sentiment to ban fracking. So I'm not saying America is ideal, but I am saying that there's enough civil liberties and political Oh, 
were terrible tyrannies. All of them were corrupt. All of them were violent. Most of them were aggressors and very, very warlike. And if they weren't nation states, you had uh, tribal wars and ethnic wars and religious wars. And so is oil, oil is not the primary cause of this problem. Oil is an enabler. And even if you didn't have oil, you'd still, I mean, look at Russia. They went through czars, they went through commissars, they were oligarchs, they the essential nature of the country hasn't changed, or they're nowhere. So, good. Thank you very much for that. That's a very important question. And let me just say right off, I would never claim that oil is the only driver of pathologies in these countries. These are very complex countries' problems. But I will say that oil is coming out of the studies as a significant driver. One way you can see that is from the kind of slide I gave early on. Not oil countries in the developing world are making progress when it comes to democratization or growth, peace. The oil countries are not. So more and more of the world's autocrats, as a percentage, are petrograds because the non-oil states are democratizing those states. Are. Same with civil wars. Oil, having oil in your country gives you a 200% greater chance of having a civil war. So oil is a driver, as far as we can tell uh, the numbers. And, and let me just say another thing which picks up on uh, what David just said about, about uh, Botswana. Why are some countries oil rich but not authoritarian? The key dividing line is what were they like when the resource money came in? Was the government minimally accountable to the people when the resource money came in? If the government was minimally accountable to the people, then the people make the government use the money for public goods instead of for oppression. So Norway, Canada, the United States, these countries were minimally accountable to governments when the resources came in. And that's why Botswana is such an amazing example. The Botswana government was minimally accountable to its people when the diamond money came in. But, but that makes, uh, it maybe raises the possibility that it's the level of democracy that is decisive rather than the oil position. How do you work uh, that, that? No, that is, that's exactly it. So, uh, if you're autocratic. Even without this law one way or the other, the level of democracy, to rephrase your question, would be sort of the level of democratization is the, the determinant. Factor, whether or not they adhere to the resources belonging to the people. The determinant factor is, is the government accountable to the people? You're phrasing that in terms of democracy as if that was a separate factor. Accountability to the people. That's the way they That is the factor. Yeah. That is the crucial factor. Can you control the power of the that comes in because of this law? Yeah. So, if you have oil, you're less likely to democratize. No country with more oil than Mexico per capita has ever democratized. If you're authoritarian and you have oil, you're stuck in authoritarianism. So I'm still trying to figure out how to articulate this question, but can you just, how is it possible to change culture and how it thinks about oil consumption? Right, because the Trump administration basically said we're going to keep working with Saudi Arabia because we don't want to change, and so some, you know, so the story of how slavery changed. There's a long, long, complicated story. And um, have you thought about? Would you like to see some more movies? Would you like to see activities? What? How can we shift the, the needle on this issue? If anyone here knows a movie star who's <laughs> looking for a cause, we would love to have a clean trade movie star. Um, that, that stuff really does help. You can see what Clooney and Damon did for South Sudan, uh, Uganda, that sort of thing. It's really extremely helpful. So that can help. The, people don't like thinking that they're complicit in these terrible things going on overseas whenever they buy stuff. That is one of the main books. But I have to say, when I get these talks, sometimes the national security threats really are what drive people. I mean, we've been paying for this stuff our whole lives, and all these threats and crises keep coming back to us. I'm just going to say, if you're old enough to remember the Soviet Union, the greatest existential threat we've had, that was oil and gas money. That's what was buying the missiles and the jets and so on. So sometimes it's a matter of self-interest um, that gets people's attention, as well as this state complicity argument. So, uh, thank you for the interesting
talk. Uh, I have two questions. The one, first one is to kind of press on this idea of minimal accountability that you uh, have been uh, using. Uh, so if you think about an example like the UAE, where you have very small citizenship and they all get a share of the proceeds, they do have an authoritarian regime, does this come to the matter of some sort of minimal accountability, which would seem rather troublesome uh, on many levels since it obviously has a number of human rights concerns in various uh, emirates. That's the first question, and just using that case to help refine that maybe a little bit. Uh, and, and second one is a broader question about you know whether you see what you're doing as part of a larger set of problems. Uh, because if you're talking about resources being owned by the people, you're talking about a model of popular sovereignty. Uh, and the international legal system, especially at the pragmatic level, uh, simply doesn't operate with that model. It's just, it has a different model of sovereignty at heart. Uh, where, you know, like Cheney Ryan, you know, is quite eloquent in writing about how this is the motor of conflict and war throughout, you know, international society. Uh, and, and so, is this, do you see it as part of a subset? And if it is part of a subset of this, can you really resolve it uh, through trade rules as opposed to really confronting the central issue about how sovereignty is recognized in the international context? Good. I think those are terrific questions. So on the first point about UAE and so on, when you look at the language of the human rights treaties, it says, all peoples may, for their own ends, freely dispose of their natural wealth. This is a control standard. It's not a benefit standard. It's not a benefit standard. People in the Emirates get benefits from the oil, but what we really mean is that the oil belongs to the people, and if someone stole your car and gave you back some of what they thought was the fair value, that is not respected in property rights. So it's a control standard. The people have to be able to understand what's happening to their resources, protest it, potentially stop what's happening. And the Emirates are far below the line. But let me just mention, Kuwait is above the line, right? Kuwait does have a minimally functioning problem, and Kuwait is not a democracy by any means. So we're not asking every country to be Norway, right? The line is pretty low. Even with that low line, 50% of the world's traded oil comes from below it. That's the, uh, that's the oil course. The second question is a sophisticated question of international law. So you're absolutely right that we are pushing element of self-determination, but we're only doing the subset. Our argument in legal terms is for popular resource sovereignty. And you're going to say, well, that's a bit. Let me give you my long law review article, just about uh, finished, about the status of popular resource sovereignty in international law. It's actually more solid than popular sovereignty in general, which we do not uh, push because that's too hard for us. Popular resource sovereignty is very solid and for an interesting reason. Because countries in the third world, resource rich countries, especially countries like Chile, wanted to get the language into the treaties and into the declarations for decades to keep the American companies away from their copper and away from their oil. Right? So, you know, you go to Brazil, petróleo de Poso, the oil is ours. Right? This is the great anti imperialist slogan of these countries. Those countries insisted that the language was put into these documents, and that's why that language in particular about natural resources is stronger than the general, general language of the popular spot. Um, thanks for the talk. Uh, I think I'm largely in agreement with most of what you say, but I'm wondering about like the normative story here. Like, so going off what people are saying, maybe we have this moment to replace this really, you know, old 300-year-old principle of international law, and I'm wondering whether we want to replace it with this principle that relies on this idea of peoples, rather than like seizing that opportunity to be more democratic and moving beyond this sort of idea of nations, moving to directly to individuals, moving to more accountability. Um, and how would you sort of see that? I mean, like. That language is obviously in the treaties. It's a little bit weird to think of the human rights of a people. And then I'm, I'm just wondering how you would connect up that to the rights of the individual to humans that make up the people. You know, I, I, it's still part of this whole story, but you have something to say about that. So it's interesting. This kind of issue is really important. Now, the, the question varies by location. So when I go to Arizona and give this talk, 
a lot of times the question is, why do we say that the people of a country own the natural resources? Why don't we say that individual property rights own the natural resources? When I go to Frankfurt, the question is, why should we say that the people of the country own the resources? Why not all the people of the world own the resources, right? So it really does depend on your perspective. If you're in favor of cosmopolitan control of the world's resources, all I can say is this reform is a step on your way. If there is going to be a cosmopolitan future, we need to get rid of a lot of these resource curse phenomena, authoritarianism, civil conflict, international terrorism, and so on. And it's going to happen when it happens by democratically capable peoples of countries voluntarily coming together to create larger units. So if there's going to be a united persons instead of a united nations, this is one step on the way to that. Hi. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, uh, just to press this a little further, uh, on the notion of accountability, which uh, it, it seems like you uh, used lack of accountability as sort of an interchangeable term with authoritarianism, which I'm not entirely sure uh, I'm convinced by. Uh, and if that's, I mean, if that's not the, if I'm misrepresenting here, uh, to let it know. But, uh, I mean, the, the lack of democratization of the country uh, doesn't necessarily give the government or whoever's in control uh, the ability to bypass traditional uh, mechanisms of accountability. Uh, it's not as though uh, authoritarian countries can, uh, really under any circumstances, entirely disregard the will of the people. Like, you need some kind of popular base, uh, regardless. And so I, I just wanted to press a little farther on uh, how specifically, because uh, you've, you've given a, a basic definition of what you mean by political accountability, but uh, which, which metric of authoritarianism and to what extent are those two terms interchangeable? Good, thank you very much. And as a political philosopher, I was just thinking that I would go to one of my wonderful colleagues and plug in her theory of accountable governance, right? And I searched everywhere. I didn't find any of my wonderful colleagues had an account of what it is to be a minimally accountable government, accountable to the people. So I just had to make it up. And, and here's the account of minimal accountability. It really is, can the people find out What's happened to their resources? Can they protest them without fearing for their life and their liberty? And if enough of people will do things to change about the resources, will they change in a reasonable time? So those are really minimal, bare bones, civil liberties, and political rights. There's a lot of metrics out there that measure just those kinds of things. They all have their biases. So for the Clean Trade Index, we use a index, what index? We use a meta index. So we use The Economist. We use the World Bank's Worldwide Governance Index, and we use Freedom House. Uh, so the red countries I showed there, if you want to think of it, that's Freedom House not free. Now, you ask, you know, how, how closely does that account rule out authoritarians as authoritarians are understood? I don't want to own the word authoritarian. If you have another understanding of what it is to be authoritarian, I'm happy to talk about that. I really put in my emphasis on minimal accountability in this very basic way. Can people find out can they protest if they do this thing? Will something change? Uh, let's get more to the other side. I think John did a question first. My question is a bit more on the practical side. Um, wondering sort of what policies uh, clean trade is going to advocate for. So like one problem, of course, is just because some countries sort of don't buy blood oil from some other country, it doesn't mean other countries won't do that. So it seems like it would need to be a cooperative effort. Um, and I was curious too that you didn't really mention this solution that I read about in, in your uh, PPA article about like the like a trust tariff. Yeah. Um, I guess I was wondering whether or not you advocate for that in clean trade or what do you think about that? practical solution now. So I didn't say anything about the Clean Hands Trust, and I don't tend to emphasize that because the first thing we need to do is to get the Clean Trade Acts in place. The Clean Trade Acts are 
bans on the imports of vegetarian oil. That really has to be job one. We've done the work on that, how it's WTO GAC compatible. Clean Hands Trust, we can certainly do it. I still want to do it, but it's a little harder uh, to do. So first priority is stop the uh, imports. It's true, you'd have to get a lot of countries to do it. Let me just say, there's a lot of oil in the world right now, unfortunately. Not only the US, not only North America, but all of the West could stop buying authoritarian oil. We just don't need to buy oil from those guys anymore. It's cheap to do it in, a, in the United States, almost costless. For Europe, it's more expensive. Lots of energy coming in from Russia, some from Qatar, some from Algeria. So for Europe, it's more expensive. I asked Nick Butler, who's one of our colleagues at King's, he's the energy columnist for the FT. I asked Nick, you know, how long would it take to get Europe off of authoritarian oil? And he said, well, what countries? And I showed him a list of countries in red. He said, really? You want Europe to stop buying energy from Russia? I said, yeah, how long? He came back the next time and said, it'd probably take three to five years and cost tens of billions of euros. Tens of billions of euros is a lot of money, for sure. But if you put it in the context of defense spending, for example, it's feasible. And when you see those national security threats coming from resource-rich countries like Syria, Libya, and so on, it might be a reasonable proposition, even for Europe.
So it just seems to be an argument for democratization rather than an argument for changing international law. Uh, because what's the effective difference between saying it belongs to the people and saying it belongs to the government? The effective difference is the degree of democratic control over each government. I think we're saying the same thing. Right, but then no the, you know, it comes down to some countries not being democratic. Tell me, what, what's the best thing to do about that? Here's one thing we can do. Change international law so it's no longer legal to buy resources from anyone not accountable to them. You could change international law so it's not legal not to have a democratic system. But that was that was the previous question, right? Okay, Some people have tried that. That effort is not going well. No. Right? That's that's a huge lift. Right? A lot of people are enthusiastic about that. They had a brief flight phase in the early nineties, Thomas Frank and that. So that that effort has phased out. There you're trying to delegitimize whole governments. With clean trade, you're not delegitimizing any government. You're saying, look, who rules in your country is none of our business. We Westerners have told you people who should rule your countries too much. Right? You don't want to go back to the Iranians and say, we Americans have decided again who's going to rule your country. Right? All we're saying is that we believe the country belongs to you, and so we're not liable. And wouldn't you need any distributional changes within the countries to accompany totally this? For them. That's for the people of Iran. But wouldn't that be important if it was going to actually have some impact? It's extremely important. It's none of our business. That has to be done by the Iranians. Yeah. So it's just a question. And the Saudis. All right, that's a clarification. The whole point is so the oil. Because we're videotaping. At what point does oil sort of you know, change its identity? I mean, the, the, you know, I, I was involved in the And you know what goes on on the high seas is is um, you know changes its identity. People you know ships change names and all sorts of yeah. interesting things. Yeah. So as it happens, oil is this is this is how oil is easier to control than diamonds. Diamonds are small, and when you polish them, it's hard to tell where they come from. Oil, we know where it comes from. It travels on big, heavy ships. You can even go to a great website right now called. TankerTrackers.com, these heroic Norwegians are tracing every single oil tanker in the world and showing really interesting things. For example, like where Israel is getting its oil, uh, which is very interesting because the Israelis will not tell us that but it seems to be coming from their traditional adversaries. Um, so oil we can trace. Let me just, can I just give you another inspiring story actually from your own industry of transparency? I gave the story about blood diamonds. You might think that oil is harder because the oil companies are so big. Change can't happen. And it's another story where activists kept pushing and pushing and nothing happened. So in this case, it was about transparency in oil. Oil is a very opaque business. And the people of the country, it's just hard for them to figure out how much money their government was getting. Activists knew that this was a big problem. They tried, they pushed for transparency in oil. Try to get legislation so that whenever an American company gives money to a foreign government, they have to report it. And they got nowhere. They convinced a couple of senators, built it, didn't get out of the committee for years because the oil was so strong. And then the window of opportunity opened. And in this case, it just so happened it was deep water horizon. Remember that BP oil well that blew up in 2010 in the Gulf of Mexico? It was terrible. Love people died. But during that summer, big oil was toxic in Washington. The lobbyists could not get their phone calls returned. So the activists got a hold of their senators, and the senators reintroduced the bill, and at 11.59 p.m. on the last day, they put it into that big Dodd-Frank Act. And so it became law in America that all US-listed companies had to report how much money they were giving to foreign governments. And the great thing about that story is once one country moved, other countries followed. So once the U.S. did that, then Norway passed a similar law, then Canada has passed a similar law, and then now the European Union has passed a similar law for transparency. So sometimes when the first country jumps, then the other countries follow. It seems hard, but again and again, even with oil, when the window of opportunity comes, we have our stuff ready to go. Maybe something Thank you for a great talk. Um, I just answered my question with that. But um, 
Because my question is, to what extent your argument assumes or relies on the notion that it's a better? Okay. Um, but it's what? Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, or do you need to get closer? Okay. Um, to what extent does your argument rely on the idea that people being able to pass this legislation in their countries will stop companies, legal companies, from scheming in ways that keep countries in conflict such that um, they can have more access to oil. So I say that in the context of Venezuela, and Venezuela was a country which, I mean, we've had oil since the beginning of the 20th century, but it was also known for a while as like, you know, the shining democracy of Latin America. So it may count as one of the countries in which you said that there was, well, when we got the oil um, in the 20s, we were under dictatorship. But for a while, we seemed to have this democratic period in which there was put to good use to some extent. Um, and now we're in this current boundary that we're in. So it seems that, I don't know if Venezuela counts as an example of a country go, that can go from being democratic and somehow minimally accountable and using it for good purposes and then turning into something that's not that. Yeah. And I'm not sure that the story of how Venezuela went from one phase to the other has to do with, I mean, it doesn't have anything to do with the Mind Makes Right legislation because that was in place the whole way through. Um, some people might think that U.S. interference with Venezuela and Venezuela in some ways challenging capitalism has more to do with the story, in which case, um, so long as a country wants to put its oil money into projects that, say, challenge big oil companies and their interests, um, that, might make, that might turn them actually anti-democratic, or it might make geopolitical forces want to interfere with those countries. So I just feel like Venezuela is a complicated example in terms of the story that you're trying to tell. I'm wondering. Venezuela is the most complicated example for many of the reasons you just said. Uh, first, let me just say, what's happening in Venezuela for the past few years is it's just awful. It's just a tragic instance. And, and the last thing I, I believe that we need is for the Americans to put in anything cause trouble down there right now. But I wish we would do that sort of thing again. So you're right that Venezuela has a ton of oil, perhaps the largest reserves in the world. And it's been trouble for a while. As you know, the, one of the co-founders of OPEC was Venezuela. He said, look at all this Lacura, Lacura, madness. He called it the devil's ice cream.
by the Sudan, an oil revenue. Yeah. Okay, well, what happens to them? There's a humanitarian aspect here. You're talking about hundreds of millions of people. Good. That's absolutely true. Uh, let me just say, sticking with the regime we have has humanitarian consequences. Civil war, authoritarianism, hunger, all that stuff. So staying with what we're doing, sending our money to the people who are attacking and oppressing the people, that has humanitarian consequences. These countries don't have to stop selling oil. In my view, the oil will flow. The world needs that oil. The question is, who's going to sell it? So if the West stops buying that oil, will that be enough to encourage the reformers in those countries to take more control over the government so that the oil can flow Well, on that note, I'm joining in thanking um, 